Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Tea and Tales program. My name is Nikki, and I'm the curator at the Pemberton Museum. And I have with me today Louise McDonald, who's a longtime museum member, who's going to help co present today. Um, I want to start off just by saying that this Tea and Tales program is taking place within the traditional territories of those who were here first. Um, Betsy Jack was an elder living in the area in 1958. She was born in Port Douglas in 1888 and died in Vancouver in 1974. This is one of the oldest interviews the museum has in archives. And, um, A.W. Bill Spetch arranged the interview between Betsy Jack and Margaret and Slim Fulberg, and it took place in his house in Mount Curry. Bill was the son of Samuel Spetch and operated a store in Mount Curry starting in 1937. The Fulbergs were collectors of local history and were integral in the establishment of a museum. <clears throat> Margaret was also an author of the book Pemberton, History of a Settlement, along with Francis Decker and Mary Molly Ronan. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to give you some context, this interview is done in 1958, so I need to take you way back in time here to talk about what kinds of things happened during Betsy's life. She was born in 1888. So here's a brief timeline of some of the major events of changes in the traditional territories of Port Douglas and Mount Curry. So in 1888, the year she was born, John Curry and his partner McDonald applied for a preemption of District Lot 164 and 165. McDonald left Pemberton in 1890, but John Curry stayed. And uh, District Lot 164 and 165 is a large uh, portion of lands just up here from the museum, between here and the turnoff to the Upper Meadows. In 1885, 10 years or more after John had settled in the area with his native wife, Seraphine, and she was from Fountain, BC, the government established a post office on his farm. In 1895, W.M. Miller preempted land and built the house that's at the museum. This is the house that we call the Sean's house. It's right at the entrance. In 1905, the Owl Creek Hatchery, a project of the federal government, opened on the Birkenhead River. This was a massive project in its day and provided employment for people. In 1911, 13 chiefs presented the Declaration of the Lillooet Tribe to the Crown and British Government. This declaration is an assertion of sovereignty over traditional territories and remains today an important document in the history between First Nations, federal government, and the province. In 1914, the railway arrives in Pemberton and District, and this brings many new settlers to the area. 1915 to 1930s, one-room schools are established in the Upper Valley, Birkin, and Pemberton Station. And in the 1930s, a one-room school is built in Mount Curry. In 1947, the Pemberton Valley Diking District is established and begins drainage and diking works including the lowering of Lillooet Lake. At the same time, the Bridge River Power Plant begins building transmission lines along the lake. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of big projects going on in the area. So this is the beginning of another new era of settlement. In 1956, big-scale logging arrives with Fleetwood logging, logging down along Lillooet Lake. In 1956 through 58, Pemberton Secondary High School was built. And <clears throat> the village of Pemberton is established. And in 1965, the highway arrives, though it's still a very long trip to Vancouver. So the museum has a collection mandate that tells us what we should collect, and one of the mandate themes is those who were always here, those here first. The authors and many contributors to the archives through the er early period of this collection effort provided the information that underlies chapter one in the history book. And the history book was published in 1977. 
There's a story in the book titled Reminiscences of Betty Jack, and when we were looking in the archives for first-person stories for this program, we uh, found a file titled Betsy Jack, and this had handwritten interview notes from the Faubergs along with two different type versions. So Louise and I will be narrating the interview from the notes that we have on file. <clears throat> but to give the notes a little bit more context, we thought we'd start by just reading you the reminiscences of Betty Jack from the history book so that you've got some context of the story and then we'll read the interview notes. The interview notes will provide more information that was collected during that interview. So I'm going to turn things over to Louise. Do I just, oh, sorry, I had to say about Louise. Louise is a BC resident, and she, uh, her parents moved to Seashell, but she uh, carried on living in Vancouver and going to St. Anne's Academy. And what, three times a year, you'd make a trip home to Seashell. And she uh, would travel with a lot of the kids from St. Mary's Mission, St. Mary's School and Mission as well, because a lot of those kids were also going to Seashell. And uh, Louise moved to the Pemberton area in 1993, and has been a long time museum member since then. So thank you for helping us out today. Probably a lot of people have read this, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Well, this is the reminiscence of Ben Jack, born, as Cynthia said, in Port Douglas, 1888 and died in Vancouver in 1974. When the white men came, everybody got married. My mother-in-law, for six years, had lived with my father-in-law before they were married. Old Goodwin Purcell married a woman named Mary. They were married in the old church. The first church at Douglas, so we're down at the top of um, Harrison Lake there, Fort Douglas. The first church at Douglas was made of rough lumber. Old Basil Charlie's father made the altar. It was lovely. The benches were lovely too. We pulled the old church down and we built the new one. Both were St. Joseph's. Skookum Church is the Sacred Heart. The Indians had to pay to get the three towers. That church cost a lot of money. There was just a little trail for the Indians to drag the lumber. Bishop William Duke blessed the church. Uh, he was the bishop of the Westminster area. And then um, Betsy speaks of the Indians dragging the lumber. Would that be a little trail from the, the lake, do you think, where they would come in? The men, they were clearing at St. Mary's School. Boats and canoes took them right down to Mission. Some Indians walked down in moccasins every year, so it was a long time ago. Ignis Jacob started the Mount Curry Band. That's the musical band. He, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he had learned music at St. Mary's in Mission and he had learned English so fast. Then he took a correspondence course in music. When I was about five, my father died. We couldn't afford shoes and stockings. My uncle's mother used to trap little squirrels that got the apples in our cellar and made me stockings and moccasins. It was a tough life with my stepfather just about killing me. That was over. These whites that came first gave me 25 cents and 50 cents. I gave the money to my grandmother. She put it away and saved it for my shoes. I had fur inside my shoes for stockings. In 1908, when I was going to be married, they took me to New Westminster with my mother. It was the 24th of May. We got to New Westminster and there was a message from the priest. I was going to get married to the guy that took me down. 
No, Lord, I said to the bishop, I'm not going to do that. The third time he blessed me. I knelt down a long time with the bishop, Bishop Dauntonwell. I had my last confession. I was going to be married tomorrow. I didn't want to. I had 11 kids, girls of mine married into the White Act, boys married into the Indian Act. My husband died in 1951. You want me to sing the So just a note there at the end, she talks about how her daughter is married into the White Act. Mm -hmm. So what she's talking about there is until 1985, an indigenous woman married a white man, she lost her status. So you, as a woman, your status was dependent on who you married. And if you married uh, somebody from a different band, uh, your status moved to that band. But that changed under Bill C-31 in 1985 to basically modernize uh, women's rights to match the Canadian Charter. So now we're going to read the uh, actual notes that this piece in the history book is based on. And uh, I'm going to ask the questions that the Fobergs were asked. And Louise is going to read the notes from uh, Betty's responses. So tell us about the courthouse at Port Douglas. It fell down under weight of snow. Falls were as deep as ten feet. The deer came out onto the beach because the snow was so deep in the woods and were slaughtered. No deer now. Why was a courthouse necessary? Because a lot of folks around there and people were traveling through to the Caribou Road. A man hung himself at Port Douglas. Two policemen came in for him. He'd been killing, taking people's eats. Walks in, takes what he wants. Killed even his own people, if they were alone. They took the man down that night to Port Douglas. And he hung himself in the jail put a blanket over the bar, and was found dead in the morning. Who was the first priest you remember? Father Fulcat, and Father Charus, and Father Roar. When the white man came, everybody got married. Old Goodwin Purcell married a woman named Mary. She was the mother of Catherine and Albert Purcell. They were married in the old church. The first one, we pulled it down when we built the new one. Both called St. Joseph's. Skookum Church is the sacred heart. Indians had to pay to get the three towers. That church cost a lot of money. There was just a little trail for the people to drag that lumber. Bishop William Duke blessed it. And Betsy continues, I went to Rosie Stager's wedding. One of Betsy's sons married Rosie's daughter. And her name was Rita, she later died. The first church at Douglas was made of rough lumber. Old Basil, Charlie's father made the altar. It was lovely. The benches were lovely too. Now the paint and cement are ready for improvements. The tower is to be lowered. We are clearing the cemetery. Tell us about travelers through Port Douglas. Charlie Morris, a settler, came this way with cattle, had about three or four cows. My father-in-law bought him up, brought him up. No roads to Pemberton, it's a tough life. And 
this a tough life. All the people here got groceries from Purcell's store, didn't they? There was a fellow at New Westminster who knew the people really well, McBride. The people used to deal with McBride, didn't they? McBride wanted to get Ignace Jacob away from his people. McBride wanted the franchise, but Ignace Jacob wanted to go back to his people. He had been at St. Mary's in Mission in the old times, where he looked after the grounds. He learned English very fast and took a correspondence course in music. Mrs. Jack told of a parade in Mission, and Ignace was with them. A mistake was made by a young man in the band. He said, you made a mistake, boy. And then he was put in charge of the band. <laughs> There was a big praise of him. Felix Sam looked after him in the last years of his life. He died in 1923 or 24. What other memories do you have? The men, they were clearing St. Mary's School. People from Fountain, boats and canoes took them right down to Mission. The people walked down in moccasins every year and cleared land at Mission. This is before they had shoes. When I was five, my father died. Couldn't afford shoes and stockings. Uncle's mother used to trap little squirrels that got apples in our cellar and made me stockings and moccasins. My uncle went to Vancouver to sell his furs I stayed with my mother. It was a tough life with my stepfather, just about killing me. These whites that came first gave me five cents or fifty cent pieces. I gave to my grandmother. She put it away before I got my shoes. Fur inside for my stockings. In 1908, when I was going to be married, they took me to New Westminster. My mother and I, it was the 24th of May, steamboats on the river, got to New Westminster. There was a message from the priest. I was going to get married. No, Lord, I said to the bishop. I'm not going to do that. The third time he blessed me, I kneeled down a long time with the bishop. Done well. I believe I should be done to me. Had my last confession. I was going to be married tomorrow. I didn't want to. Um, Betsy's um, husband died in 1951. 43 years after the wedding. She says, I had 11 kids. Only Mrs. Christensen, uh, I assume that's a daughter, Regina, and Dorothy left. Girls of mine married in the White Act, boys married into the Indian Act. Agnes at Harrison was Mrs. Johnny Curry. The other John Curry, her son, who was grandson of the original in Pemberton, is at Chilliwack. John Curry, her husband, father of her son, left Agnes. She was from Mount Curry. Uh, death seemed close to uh, Betsy near about a year ago. So she and Charlie Purcell. No, not Betsy. Oh, Agnes. wasn't it Betsy? Agnes. I thought it was close for Agnes. Oh, I thought he was making fun of Betsy. Okay. Oh, all right. Death seemed near about a year ago. So she and Charlie Purcell, who have lived together for many years, were married in hospital by Father O'Brien. 
Helen, Alice, and Katie Curie, actually herself's daughters, all married into the White Act. John Curie's Agnes, he was still alive when she began to go with Charlie herself. She just, just got married. married. Agnes just got married. Three girls married in mission. Agassi, only one child by Johnny Curry. What can you tell us about Port Douglas today? Now, this is in 1950. There were no boats for years. This was after the gold rush. Not long since we've seen the gas boats around. Half the lake, Harrison Lake, belongs to the White Act, the rest to us. The land in the section that isn't reserved is all crown land. A number of people have their house on it. Goodwin Purcell didn't own land, paid taxes only. Nobody has paid taxes since Albert died. What can you tell us about the Purcells? Albert Purcell drowned during the hot picking time. I was on the boat when he drowned. My husband was working on the road at 11 Mile. I got a note that he wanted me. I gathered up a few things, took the truck. We went hot picking. It was nearly done. Albert Purcell had a big boat. Lillard. We took Don and Sarah, the others too, grown up now, to St. Mary's. We were staying at a hotel in Agassiz. In the morning, there was a knock on the door. Come on, we're going home. It was Albert Purcell. No, we're going to Hague to visit friends. Anyway, I got 100 pounds of sugar and all those things, and we started home. Albert Purcell, upstairs, roaming about his boat. Wind was nearly dying. Frank Purcell said, Uncle is gone. Albert hollered and put up his hand from the water. They were at Doctor's Point. There was some discussion as to what they should do. I said, let's go home. <laughs> they, they had a big load of freight. Well, they had this huge load of copper freight, too, by the sounds of it. Yes. He wasn't drunk. Nobody would believe it. He had given me a smoke and said, is probably the last I'll give you. Well then, Goodwin Purcell died about 1903. I was in St. Mary's School in 1901. I got in at 11 years. The old man could hardly walk when he died. Do you have any other stories you want to share with us? Bishop Johnson from Vancouver flew in by plane, confirmed kids last year, took three days to prepare for him, my bread and baker's bread on the table. He wouldn't touch baker's bread. He went right away. He was going to eat at the springs. That's Purcell's hot springs. It burned my heart. Tears rolled down my face. Father Coffin told the bishop, this is the woman that takes care of me. She always puts me into her table. Later, Father Coffin asks, have you got a cup of tea or coffee? Bishop Johnson wants some coffee. No tea, no coffee, I told them. They stayed for one hour. Four priests, four priests blessed me and himself. They had a real good meal. I felt better then. I do all the work for the priests, looking after the church. Father Rohr 
sends me notes from Luxembourg. He wants me to go and visit him. I say, Father, I can't do that. He's 84 now. Everywhere you go, people get letters from him. The priest had a retreat at St. Mary's. I went down to see them. I was one day late. I phoned Father O'Brien at St. Mary's. He said he would be over in about a half an hour. He drives slow, that guy. Has a new car, 1957. Betsy said to the priest, Father, I want to see all the priests I know. Father, please drive me over. So he would hurry up. I bought three sacks of spuds yesterday. I pay six or seven dollars at Douglas, pay fifty cents for freight on a boat, got them for a dollar sack yesterday. So she's quite tickled about this. He, meaning Bob Spedifor, said, Lady, that's quite a lot. Can put it away in the cellar, keep it for a while. I went to Mount Curry four or five times this year. It is a dangerous trip in the cars and the pickups. Some sections of roads have steep hills. My sister is Mrs. Joseph. Today, I look after five grandchildren and have food on the table when they come home from school. More uh, information here about the Purcells. So you might be aware of the hot springs down along Lillooet Lake. Uh, they're known as St. Agnes's Hot Springs today. The history of those springs is they were uh, a First Nations uh, sacred site originally, and then they were discovered by the gold rushers who hadn't had a bath since San Francisco, so they were pretty thrilled about it. And uh, W.E. Stein had uh, purchased or he was the owner of the hot springs at Douglas Portage. And this is an ad that was in the uh, newspaper down in the city saying um, that he wishes to inform the traveling community in general that the above being a large three-story building will be found one of the most comfortable houses in New Westminster. Meals and beds, 50 cents each, drinks, 12 cents. Despite what he thought was a giveaway price though, there were no takers and he eventually abandoned the property the original 40-acre preemption was taken over years later by the former handyman Goodwin Purcell. Goodwin had stayed in the country, married a local native woman, and traded out of the old abandoned town site at Port Douglas. He had the hot spring property surveyed in 1897, and he added more land to the parcel. Goodwin died in 1906 at the age of 91, and it was from his descendants that title to the historic property passed to the Trithui family in the 1950s. Today the site, as I understand it, is managed by Skatine Nation. So it's, not, I think, been returned to First Nations. And then a note about St. Joseph's Church at Port Douglas. I was at Port Douglas a few years ago. I didn't see a church. So I don't believe it's standing anymore. But it was in 1958 when Betsy gave this interview. <laughs> no, she says both churches were called St. Joseph's. And I did a search of the archives just to see if we had any images. And we do have images of this church in Port Douglas. But it was called St. Mark's Church of Port Douglas. And it was floated on six dugout canoes to Chilliwack in 1873 and was reconstructed as the St. Thomas Anglican Church. It was demolished in 1879 when a larger church was built. Can you imagine picking up a church and floating it? <laughs> You've seen the size of Paris and Pike. That would be quite the journey. And then we weren't able to find too much information on this McBride. But out of New Westminster, I did find a reference to an AWS McBride, Arthur McBride. And he replaced C.J. Pritchard as the warden of the New Westminster Jail. And uh, he also was the colonial secretary by 1866. And shortly after McBride became the warden, the jail was renovated. There was a real focus on law and order at that time. So 
that is um, the presentation that we've prepared for you. But if anyone has any more info or questions, we're happy to Thank you for help answer research. research. <coughs> it takes a lot of time. Well, thanks to the archives here, it actually it's just a matter of reading. But there were different uh, versions of these notes, starting with the onion skin handwritten notes through some badly first typed editions, and then eventually the toilet cleaned up copy.